Attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings and welcome to this joint DCMI ACES webinar, Implementing Linked Data in Low Resource Conditions with Johannes Kaiser and Katarina uh, Caraccio. Uh, my name is Stuart Sutton and I'm Managing Director of DCMI. It's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters and the DCMI ACES webinar series. Uh, the webinars in the series are brought to you um, as a service to the membership of DCMI and ACES and to guests. The goal of the webinars is to advance both the discourse and the practice of innovative metadata design, implementation, and use. Today's presenters are with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, Johannes is head of the FAO Documentation Group, and Katarina is an information specialist responsible um, for the Agrivoc concept scheme as well as other activities within the FAO Documentation Group. You will have an opportunity uh, at, to ask questions of the presenters at the end of their presentation. I will moderate the Q&A session. Please understand that we may not have time to address every question asked in one hour and 15 minute time frame. Now with that, I will turn the webinar over to Johannes and Katarina. Hi, hello everybody. I'm Katarina Caracciolo, as um, Stuart already introduced me. I've been in NFAO for about nine years and currently I'm the uh, manager of the Agrivoc Thesaurus. And, and this is Johannes Kaiser. And I'm very happy here to be with two heads on my, on my head. Uh, one is the uh, team leader here of our agricultural information management standards team in FAO, but then also as member and responsible for strategic partnerships in the Global Open Data for Agricultural and Nutrition Initiative, which is a new initiative in the area of open data for agriculture. And I'm happy to uh, be able to introduce this also in our webinar. Okay. The goals for today's for today's are the following. We would like to give you a high level view of what is needed to do linked data. And while doing so, we would like to identify possible bottlenecks that are due to working with little resources. And then based on our experience, we'll give you some suggestions and hints on how to overcome these bottlenecks. Uh, well, of course, this is a big topic actually, so we um, need to make some restrictions. And uh, what we have in mind, the target o our target audience in mind is uh, small to medium-sized institutions. Um, keeping in mind that this talk is not meant to, be give, to give you like a technical guide on how to do things specific, uh, like a server uh, administration and the like, but rather to give you sort of a, a view on uh, help or some suggestion on how to plan your entering the linked open data world. So what type of data are we thinking of? Uh, mainly we think of textual data, uh, something, uh, the type of data that about everybody's got, like a list of publications or catalogs that could be even specimens in local museums or even fact sheets about plants, animals, or organizations in collaboration, and so on. So the topics that we are touching on today are, well, first of all, we would like to um, make clear what our understanding of what the low resource uh, means, and then uh, talk about open data and linked open data. Um, give you an overview of the data life cycle in this context and there identify the bottlenecks and I will suggest them to, over, to, to overcome them. And we'll give you a practical example of uh, Agris. So um, there are many ways, so in many senses, one could be, uh, uh, um, could, have, could experience uh, low resources. Um, to us, the most perhaps the most important or one that seriously has to be taken in consideration is the IT competencies. Usually, um, the 
most common situation is that there are few IT people around um, in our institution. They are over busy with many tasks and duties. Uh, but the technology is fast moving, and actually, what they learned in school is uh, just uh, uh, it's not enough. There is a need for personal update, and then here comes another problem that the working environment might not encourage this. Um, and even if this is the case, there might be a problem with the with the language. Mm. Other issues that we uh, often come across is um, the need for some competencies on legal issue. So what type of license should be applied? What is a license and a copyright and so on? What should be, what, how, what to do in case of uh, controversies or litigation? Um, other cultural issues are related to the personal attachment often to, uh, to the data. So if this is my data, I don't want to share it, and this is a, um, um, something that happens even without a single organization. Also, there might be differences in how people look at data and at problems, really. So there might be the view of domain specialists who know their domain and they know what the data is, what the data is about, and they uh, don't want to spend time on things that are extra to their core work. But on the other side, IT people may think that some time spent of, on uh, linking, standardizing the data is, uh, um, is well spent. So, and the, here there is a possible source of, uh, um, of tension. All these issues require some time, some investment in time, and there, this is also a uh, resource that we are usually short of. Then, of course, there is a software side. Um, we might have uh, outdated operating systems and software because they might cost some money, the licenses, or even it's not because it's not considered a priority in the culture, um, in the culture of the institution. Of course, there might be problems or um, constraints on the hardware. And even other constraints, like electricity, might be unreliable or occasionally available or even expensive, or in the internet connection that is fundamental for this, uh, for us, maybe is low, or, and, or dependent on the weather, depending on the, um, on the situation. Um, so what to do, what to do? Well, let's look at the data. The trend right now, you might be aware of this, but the trend is to pay great attention to data. Uh, in this sense, interoperability of data is fundamental. So data that can be reused, processed, but produced by somebody in some other application and processed uh, in other applications. To this end, the adoption of standards and open formats is considered crucial, and actually is crucial. And, um, and the maximum use usability is uh, applies because data is commonly shared over the web. So in this, uh, in this framework, open data sits in this framework. What is open data? Really in a nutshell, uh, open is, um, means open like in any other open movements. That means open and free. Uh, you can look up the uh, definition and its, uh, its um, implication at this website. And um, in practice, it's open data usually applies uh, to um, government-generated data, this phrasing. So for example, publication of census data, public investments, housing environment, these sort of things. It can be, this data can be exposed in various ways, variety of formats, um, XLS, CSV, XLM, JSON, but even PowerPoint, SDMX. Yeah. Uh, this is this is interesting that uh, uh, Katarina here you know goes on machine readable also also formats. I remember on the G8 summit in April 2013 in Washington, uh, Secretary Wilsax, the Secretary of Agriculture of the United States government, said uh, uh, open data is data that are uh, available and usable without restrictions and machine readable. Uh, this is an interesting. Uh, 
an interesting definition because uh, there is a difference between theoretical hope and you can get it and practical hope when you can do something with it. Because if you get a bunch of PDF pages, uh, you can't do anything else with them than reading it uh, piece by piece with, uh, with your own human eyes. Exactly. And the, um, the other side of openness is whether the, for, the format, this machine readable format, are uh, proprietary or non proprietary. Uh, you can go for either way, but uh, really the preference is to go for non proprietary formats. Well, openness, again, most of the data around is open already, more or less. Uh, that means that um, it's up there on a website, you can grab it, but with a little uh, attention to the licenses around. So one thing to keep in mind, I mean, something that it's important is for you to check out whether your countries produce a national policy on data, which is getting more and more common, actually. Who does open data already? A really great number of uh, open data initiatives are out there. This list is by no means exhaustive. Uh, there are these national, both national and regional initiatives or collection, regional collection of national initiatives as well. So you can see the, uh, this uh, Africa from Africa, from UK, from US, from Latin America, Europe, Australia, India, and so on. And also uh, global and uh, sectoral initi initiatives like, for example, Gordon, that Ioannis is going to tell us about. But why do people actually go for open data? In our view, these are the main reasons. Uh, well, this is not our own view. <laughs> uh, the need to increase trans transparency of governments and institutions is very strong, and open data um, addresses this need, but also the, to, need to create new business opportunities. And also there is a reason that uh, it's the way to go now. So if you want to be uh, in the in the common in the world in now the mainstream. in the mainstream, you think of going for open data. Yeah, and right. this is a place to introduce you Godan, Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition, uh, which is a follow-up product of this uh, big summit in April 2013 in Washington. Uh, where a group of countries and international organizations as the core group towards uh, DFID from the UK, USDA, FAO, the CGIR. Um, for many of you not from the agricultural area, these acronyms will not say anything. But I, think, I would say the main players in the area have come together uh, to uh, launch a bigger initiative uh, about, uh, about open data. Uh, Godan is uh, young, but uh, if you see where uh, the, there are a lot of gaps, but also already a lot of partners, and we are especially happy uh, that uh, we are uh, already working and contacting in low resource conditions, where we are talking about in this webinar. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, an example uh, from Burkina Faso. Uh, uh, of their published open data about social social indicators in their in their, in their country. Uh, in the end of October, in Cancun, will be uh, a meeting of the Godan Donor Group, and this will be associated to the big OGP meeting, what is the Open Government Partnership, where uh, many governments uh, work together to get some uh, agreements, rules, and policies about government's data that have to be published uh, for the advantage of uh, their own population, but also the advantage of other populations. Uh, and this is not, and this is very important, not only uh, limited to public sector. It is a very important goal that also the private sector, and in the private sector, uh, the, the agro-industry uh, is contributing. And Syngenta, one of the big uh, agro-industry companies, uh, has made uh, a step in publishing uh, their data. Because industry should not only be a consumer of uh, available data, what they surely are and what they surely want, and there are especially young entrepreneurs who are interested that more data are open, but also there is a societal obligation and a societal challenge for the big uh, uh, agro-industry 
to publish more of their data. Katarina will now uh, bring in this new thing, linked open data. Linked open data. Um, again, like uh, any other open movements, uh, we need, uh, we talk about open and free in the two senses. Uh, so actually, technically, you could also have linked data without the open in between. But uh, we tend to, at least here in this, in this talk today, we have what we have in mind is linked open data. Um, when you, when you say linked open data, there is typically no assumption on the type of data or no on the domain. Um, but there is an assumption about the format of the data because the format of choice here is RDF, which may be made available in various civilizations. So for example, XML, Tarful, and Preples, and Quads, and so on. These are all possible formats for RDF. Um, the idea is not just a data set, not putting out data sets as in open data, but putting out data sets that are linked to other data sets and even more each individual piece of data or various pieces of data linked to other pieces of data somewhere else in other data sets. What the reason to go for linked data? Um, I believe the main reason is to be able to reuse the data published by others and being used by others at the same time. Uh, you can also promote business this way. You can, um, there are already applications um, made for business based on linked data. And there is also a, there is also a, um, a reason um, that is same way that your data won't be isolated, won't be no longer stay in isolation, you won't be uh, isolated as well. You won't be left behind the information world. But of course it's an effort. So our question, your question would be, yes, okay, but it's the game really worth the candle. Well, this is up to you to decide, of course. Um, but here we give you an example. This is a screenshot from Agris, our application. Um, Johannes will be talking about Agris later on in, uh, in this talk today. And uh, this is a, an example of what you could do when you link your data up. Um, the red circle highlights the bits, the pieces of data that we do not contain. We simply access from other sources and that are put together um, because of the technology behind. So you can see the World Bank, data from the World Bank in this specific case. Actually, there are other sources that are also linked. Um, statistics from the World Bank or a scientific paper from Nature. You can see uh, the bottom um, articles from uh, Wikipedia, here at Wikipedia, or statistics from the FAO Country Profile and IFRI, other resources from FAO and uh, CC organizations. This is an example. There are other examples uh, out on the web, uh, um, but I think the main, clear, um, the main idea behind is clear. Uh, so, question, uh, should I go for open data or linked data? Uh, there is no really, um, these are, can, they can be seen as two steps, uh, two phases along the same line if you want. So you, would, you should decide based on your own situation and your own goals. Uh, rule of thumb is that open data requires less effort. Um, most of the time, it simply requires packing up your data, put it on the website, and make it available for download by others. And this is good if data will be primarily used by others, uh, or you have, you have no direct interest or immediate interest in linking to other data sets. On the other hand, linked to open data may be more complex because of this linking step. But it's good if you want to exploit your own data yourself, um, that is uh, the Agris example I just mentioned, or um, enhance your library or document repository, and then en enhance your library or document repository with uh, data produced by others. Um, now I'll give you a very high level view on a typical linked data workflow. Uh, here identified steps in the workflow. The first uh, step is, uh, I call it before the linked data. 
And the other three, the primary ones, are really uh, real lean data stuff. Now, what we, what the critical point usually for people that just start doing lean data is here in the connection between the before and the and the logs uh, phase. So when you go from a re your original let's say a uh, data set what you have right now and you have some sort of you, might, you should have some sort of conversion to get your to an RDF uh, position so this conversion can be done in uh, um, there, are, there can be different approaches to conversion um, and we'll talk about it later but they, uh, what I want to highlight here is the issue for maintenance of the data, which is everybody has. It should always, always be considered carefully. Um, the maintenance can be done in the kept in the original format, or could be moved in the RDF world. Then we have uh, the data, this data should be exposed outside. Here there is a selection of the ways of the options you have right now to expose the linked data and then of course there is a data consumption phase. So let's start with the data generation. First of all uh, some remarks on RDF, very basic remarks um, to remind you that RDF is a really very simple format, it's really about triples, it's a data format and uh, based on triples. Um, the common terminology is to call the bits of the triple subject the ID here, predicate and object, and this would be the real, the really, really the uh, graphical representation of the triple. But then these triples can be serialized in various formats, which I already mentioned here. These are the um, available formats right now. What I want to say is that uh, RDF is simple. The format is very simple, so conversions. Converting RDF it's, uh, is not such a, I mean, getting some RDF is not so tricky. Um, but the tricky part or the important part is to the predicate that you have here, the arrow. Um, why is this a, a critical role? Because it's what actually defines your data. So it's important when you want to expose your data without ambiguities. So um, the recommendation is in, or, in order to be um, linkable and used and actually usable is to use standards or de facto standards to facilitate your use of your data. So depending on, uh, I won't uh, go into de details here because it depends what vocabulary to use depends on um, the, the actual data that you have. You can use various tools around. I mentioned here the linked open vocabulary. Um, it's a um, it's a registry of uh, linked vo of vocabularies for RDF, um, and with a search uh, interface, and you can um, you can get an idea of what that's there, what available and good good for you. And there is also this document from the W3C that also has uh, useful links on the sense. So, conversion from existing format. Um, again, uh, getting RDF is relatively easy. There are many converters around, and the list is here. Um, what the approach? What approach can be followed? There are basically two approaches to this. Uh, the first uh, option is to um, do a conversion one at a time. That, in practice, is a migration. Or you could have uh, like a, a conversion schedule regularly. Of course, when the conversion is done regularly for exposing your data, your uh, data maintenance is not affected, which can be a great advantage um, or an important advantage depending on your situation because you won't need to implement your user interfaces, you won't need to train your people, uh, you would be able to save some resources. A simple example of a conversion to get the feeling for what we are talking about. Here it's a dummy table, um, ID of a book, uh, basically this is a catalog. Um, book number one has an author John D, a title this and this, and subject this and this. It's a dummy table and also a simplified version of what uh, normally 
uh, would um, you would have uh, the RDF that you get uh, from a table like this from row number one is something like this. So element one that would uh, that was our um, ID here has a, t a title, the preferred art of navigation. This is the author and this is the subject. And this is just some RDF. Then you could get some linked RDF if, for example, instead of having the navigation here, you get the, you use a URI of a resource that is already up uh, available uh, for I would say obvious reasons, I've, I've put in this example a URI of an Agrabah concept, the concept corresponding to navigation. In red, I also highlighted here the subject of the, all these triples, and I put here URI. Um, I won't go into details about URIs, but these are also um, important ingredients of, the, um, of getting linked data. And this is also a very well-known well topic so I won't go into the details here. Um, and then here, these are the properties um, I mentioned. They, what ensures you to have to have described your data in an unambiguous way. Here, the vocabulary is used are a Dublin Core for title, proper, Dublin Core property for title, creator, and subject. And this is already a pretty decent piece of uh, linked RDF, so of linked data. You could go even further and, just as an example, replace or use, link your creator thing to a, uh, use a URI of uh, Wikipedia, in this case, uh, DBpedia. And you could, um, once you get the idea, you could uh, um, get things more complicated depending on your area of, uh, of interest. So, um, here we are on the back on the maintenance side. Um, as I said, if you plan your um, conversion uh, regularly to keep the uh, the maintenance with the idea that your maintenance uh, uh, of the data will be stay untouched, you should also consider that actually there is an extra step and the step of link step of linking. So the disadvantage here is that you should plan a, a strict pipe pipeline of um, for your data maintenance and include in the, in the pipeline also this step. Um, if you want to go for the other side for migration to RDF, you may need a, a, a user interface, a graphical user interface, unless you have, you can rely on your IT person or some uh, tech savvy uh, person who can uh, deal with the data from like a programming interface or so. The problem with uh, converting your basic data, your workflows into RDF is often that those people who are uh, maintaining the data are uncomfortable with it. They, they don't know uh, how this looks like and if you don't deliver them uh, the same interfaces as they always had, they will not uh, be able anymore to do their data management. Then often there are also business processes that are not really completely covered by, by, by RDF in data management. So often the only, uh, only possibility you have is to make uh, regularly RDF outputs or to make an RDF, uh, an RDF interface to get the data without touching, without touching uh, the data maintenance flow. This is a bit an experience that we have had here. Yeah. Indeed, this is really a, a crucial point that is often uh, underestimated. Um, I will go back uh, to the point that um, uh, Johannes just uh, emphasized uh, with a suggestion for a possible solution to this, uh, just in a few slides. So, uh, for, but before going there, I would like to make a, um, um, can I say, to clarify a little bit of what, what can be linked, because there is some sort of confusion around in due to um, uh, unclear terminology that is often used. So in our view, what can be you can link to essentially two things. Either the vocabularies uh, that are used to describe the data, so the properties in the uh, slides, in the picture before, 
uh, the properties that in our example were the title, um, um, that could be title in my database or titulo in uh, somebody's uh, Spanish speaker database. And the other thing that can be linked is really is the object of the triple. That my, you might consider the actual data. So for example, the specific author of your book or item and link it to the, the same uh, author to, or link it to the information related to the same author somewhere else, for example, in Wikipedia. So the confusion that you might experience around is that there are often uh, both they are often called vocabularies, and this might be unclear also when you go and look up for tools for your needs. Um, when it goes to linking vocabularies, this uh, you will realize that this is a really still active research area. And one important example uh, is the Ontology Alignment Evaluation Initiative, right, which um, is a, a benchmark of different uh, systems and algorithms that people are devising and inventing uh, to uh, align vocabularies and ontology. Here again, a terminological note is needed, I believe, because ontology is often used as a generic term, um, the, which in practice is used to mean a, var a wide range of uh, things, from simple vocabularies to really complex ontologies uh, with uh, lo state logic statements and so on. And they also they may also include individuals like country names or even people sometimes. Um, so the suggestion, our suggestion here is if you are little on resource and try to get it right um, from the start. So uh, look for the standard vocabularies to use for properties to describe your data from the beginning to, uh, to avoid getting into linking this, this specific part. So that means be careful of your uh, design time. Mm, as I said, the other uh, things that can be linked are the individuals. Um, this is a relatively simple problem. You said the name of the author in my database and the name of the author in a different database. Uh, but still, there are a few out of the box tools. Why? Because usually the problem is the data is, so to speak, dirty. Uh, that means a different name spelling as are used, or different abbreviations, or even different orders, uh, surname first, uh, second, or um, given name. Um, or the other way around, and so on. So um, you can devise your, uh, uh, you, you might need to devise your own uh, program. This is really usually not that expensive, but it's a good idea to save on resources to prioritize on what you want to uh, link and do, like, for example, one uh, link to one uh, data set at a time. The process of linking can also be manual. Um, if you already know the resources you want to link to, you can pick up uh, one specific uh, URI, so one specific uh, piece of data you want to link and uh, make the statement somewhere. And this is really, uh, in this case, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's really simple. The other way, if, uh, which is com maybe convenient, uh, if uh, in case of big data sets, um, is to devise an uh, automatic uh, procedure that uh, gives you some candidate links and then do a manual check. The problem here, it's more a managerial problem but more than a practical problem, is that the data validation usually stays outside of the data lifecycle. It's uh, not really a practical problem in my view because uh, we have seen that experienced people, like uh, people who know the data are very quick at validating links. But again, since uh, it's done outside the, the rest of the tool and the life cycle, it will require some processing to get the data then inside your repository. Uh, now I'd like to give you a hint, like um, the assumption uh, in our view, uh, the assumption what we notice is, is that everybody has a uh, some sort of catalog of publications, events, and so on. 
one way to save uh, time and money is to go for Drupal. Drupal is a content management system that allows you to import data from uh, CSV, XML, and RSSP. Um, SQL is not mentioned here. If you have SQL, you will have to uh, convert to CSV, for example, of course. Then, but then it will create the RDF for you, um, and then you would be able to maintain the data with a graphical user interface, which will be a different, probably a different interface from what your people um, um, were used to, but still graphical with no need to interact with um, you know complex uh, um, or with interfaces that are, might be perceived more complex. And it will also allow you to expose the RDF uh, um, in some ways. Mm, so this is, again, this is good in case your data is catalogs of documents, people, or um, something similar. There is no need to, to, uh, to be a programmer, really. You won't need to have a programmer dedicated to this, but uh, then some knowledge of Drupal to the to organize the steps of the translations of the um, of the procedure are, are needed. There are also similar tools that they have the same approach. I want to mention here AgriDrupal because it's a um, it's basically it's Drupal but customized for more small institutions and it already includes a tool that allows you to tag your repository, your blogs, documents, or any other piece of uh, um, other items that you may have um, to automatically tag it with Agrovoc, which is already a linked resource, so you would be uh, pretty um, quickly in the linked data world. And the other, another option could be Scratchpad if your data is more on biodiversity, like you have a museum, you, you have a catalog from a museum or something like that. Uh, our own experience is with uh, Agrovoc. Um, I won't go in detail uh, here, but uh, this is something that uh, we can discuss pros and cons um, um, uh, in depth if needed, also in other uh, contexts. Um, and this applies, our experience applies in case you have, uh, you want to bring up to the level of linked data a controlled vocabulary, a thesaurus. In short, the steps to be taken here are a conversion of the thesaurus into a SCOS concept scheme, and then we suggest to use Vocbench for the data maintenance, it will also allow, to, uh, allow you to maintain the links, and SCOSMOS for the data visualization and search. Something that you will need is to think of a way to store your RDF. Um, there are very many triple source around. Um, if you here in this page, you have a list of benchmarks for triple stores, but you can also simply go for if uh, for the best known ones like Sesame, um, Allegro Graph, and so on. Here. Uh, the bottleneck might be on the uh, server side and the IT competences um, because you will need to have somebody able to choose for uh, the solution that best suits your um, needs. And then getting to, getting to the exposure of the data. Uh, at this point in time, we have these four main options. You can provide a dump of the data for download. You can expose the referenceable URIs. Uh, you can have a Sparkle endpoint that people can query or applications can query. And you can ex expose uh, web services. A little bit of pros and cons of uh, each uh, option. Uh, the, the good thing about having a dump is that simply you will simply need to download to, uh, to create a file, put it up on the world server and then people will download it and that's it. It's good, actually good for data consumers in many cases because they will have under control the access and 
consumption of the data will be under control, which in practice means it will be faster, more efficient. The cost is that um, um, if your data is uh, updated very um, often, it, will, it might be hard to keep the dump in sync. Um, it might be require some time, a few hours or days to uh, uh, repeat the pipeline that will bring you to have a file for a dump or download. You will need to decide the policy on versioning, which is not necessarily a con, actually. Um, and you also will have to decide on what to include in the, dump, uh, in the dump. For example, only the data, also the links, what type of metadata, and so on. Again, not necessarily a con. Actually, this is something very good to uh, decide in any case. Um, setting up uh, URIs that are different, uh, this is a mechanism that is called um, um, Okay. You will have a, a, a URIs uh, data negotiation. You will have a URIs put up on the web, um, available from uh, for everybody, and there will be make human human understand. Yes, it will be the server will decide where to whether to return HTML or RDF version. So HTML would be for human to look up, and RDF for machines to consume. The, the advantage of this approach is that your, way, your data will be always up to date, uh, so um, little care to pay uh, in this sense. Um, content, uh, you would be able to uh, be accessed by applications that need to data up, up to date. And uh, the other pro uh, is that there are already simple backends available that are, allow you to have a nicer visualization of the HTML. Um, I mentioned Fabio Lodi because we have personal experience with these two. The disadvantage is that you have to set up the content negotiation mechanism in the server. It's not a big issue really, but the server must be also up and running all the time. And um, data in, the, in this way is not directly searchable, so it will be only displayed one piece of data at a time. We can also have a Sparkle endpoint, uh, which is something that is a solution very often advertised, so to speak, but it also has um, um, disadvantage. The, the, the advantage is that really there is not much work involved um, on your side because typically the endpoint is, the, um, is provided by uh, your triple store. So your system administrator won't be really loaded with um, much um, burden in this sense, but your server will need to be up and running all the time, and there might be problems on the ability of the server to answer queries. So basically, having a Sparkle endpoint means that user can ask uh, just about run just about any queries against your database. So in case of big queries, like give me the entire data set, this may be very heavy on your server. There are solutions, new solutions under study to overcome this problem. Um, I mentioned here uh, this linked data fragments is an approach that has been uh, uh, proposed uh, and already implemented actually uh, last year. And the idea being of uh, selecting that you select your uh, fragment or link uh, of linked data for exposure, and so minimizing the uh, load on your server and giving more weight on. Um, on the client as well. Mm, web service. This is a more traditional technology. The, the, the advantage is, again, is really it's a non-technology in general that has good performances. Of course, that depends on the implementation. Um, a big advantage is that you have a control on your data. So you decide what data to expose. And so you, you put less strain on your server. Um, the thing is that it could also build, be built on top of a Sparkle endpoint, or rather on your RDF store. So this could be, in, in some cases, this could be the way to go for to be linked data, but still accommodating um, other needs, let's say more traditional needs. The disadvantage is that you will have to implement your services. 
I have just uh, only a glimpse on the problem of multilinguality. Uh, what you have strongly if you go for open data also because not everyone might understand uh, your data. Uh, this is a distribution of content languages for websites as it is reality. You see there is a, the, the huge majority is in English and this does not correspond to the distribution of languages among uh, people uh, what they are speaking really. And so there is a, uh, it's a problem of, of, uh, of searching, uh, of categorizing, and, and obviously at the end of, of reading. Uh, regarding uh, the exposure of your data and the possibility to categorize and search them, the use of, uh, of open data vocabularies can help you. If you see here this uh, example from Agrovoc, uh, we have, I don't know, how many languages do we have in Agrovoc? 23. So you have 23 languages. And if you use an Agrovoc concept like this for RISE, it can easily resolve by machines into these 23 languages, what gives you at least a bit of uh, advantage in making your data accessible for people who speak different languages. So then we come in practice. Uh, the, uh, the the practical question. Um, I'm an institution. Uh, I have limited resources, and I want to move to linked data. So, what should we do? Um, in our view, you have at least two options. Well, first of all, you need to identify what your exact bottlenecks are. Uh, what uh, what meaning? What's the meaning of low resource in your case exactly? And you can decide to address and to compose your data life cycle according to your uh, constraints. The other approach is to organize a collaboration um, that would allow you to um, uh, minimize, in a way, the effort put on uh, the actual production of the data. But then you will have to put some effort in creating partnership and networks. An example of um, the example that we know best, it's uh, that uh, we work with it every day, of, uh, of a partnership to overcome uh, resource constraints is Agris. And uh, now Johannes will talk, to you, will talk about that. Yeah, I will uh, chase, I will run now through this example because we are uh, late in time, but you will get it anyway. So, uh, but we want to leave at least some time for questioning. So the Agris network is uh, organized that you have uh, 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 more than 150 partners, but they have a, a, a shared data coordination, shared data standards, shared data processing. Uh, this is a real picture of uh, the existing Agris centers all over the, all over the world. Uh, and Agris, uh, Agris originates from the 70s and was a big bibliographical database. Now there are about 8 million records, and this is a traditional Agris record. Uh, and this is uh, how this traditional Agris record looks today. It looks enormously different because all the elements of the Agris record have been used to link to other sources. So what you see in the, in the, in the, in the upper in the upper left part is the original uh, bibliographical record. Every, and here are the related Agrovoc descriptions. Everything else is data that they are not directly in Agris, but were open data that were available in other sources and could be linked to this Agris record. Uh, I don't go into this into the details of the, of the uh, Agris uh, data flow. It's simply an implementation of that what Katarina showed in principle about how to advertise data uh, and uh, how to work with data that you get in a non-structured uh, format or in a, a semi-structured format. Uh, okay. Um, and there is a first thing of low uh, resource conditions. How to contribute uh, to, to address. And uh, one of the experiences we have is that people are looking for a cloud solution, for a very simple cloud solution. And uh, we made an AgriMeta maker, which has a, a, a web, web interface. And we thought initially only very few people would, uh, would use this, because they would prefer to have their own systems, to set up their own servers. Uh, but it's untrue, as this, uh, uh, as this uh, picture shows about the distribution of, 
uh, the metadata tools, the data production tools that Agris Providers is using, there is uh, the, the Agris MetaMaker has come to 22% of, uh, of, uh, of our partners. Uh, and uh, what, sh what shows and says a lot about low resource condition is that Web, web Agris uh, is, is more than, it's nearly 50% uh, the, the, the program, the statistic program here has made an, an error in, in giving web address and web address uh, only because of uh, spelling differences. But it, together, uh, this tool from the from the 90s, which loads, which runs on 486 computers, is still used by many many of our uh, partners. But as this tool was adapted to produce. Uh, uh, adifiable data. Also, this old tool that runs on uh, on a computer alone without web uh, connection is able to participate in the Agris uh, Agris data production. The linked data is produced by using the elements of uh, the bibliographical record. And in this case, we are not uh, purists. We are not uh, uh, adif purists. I think uh, Dan Britley or some of these ADF persons have said once, oh, at the end, the semantic web is about intelligent linking. And here is an intelligent linking using the title. And this links simply through the Google API, the Google database, with database without any ADF, but it, in, it retrieves, in many, many cases, the full text of a bibliographic uh, uh, resource. Then, obviously, the core of all the linking efforts in Agris are the agrovoc concepts. Because Agris is 80% at least is, uh, is indexed or by machines or by human beings with agrovoc concept that you see here. And behind every agrovoc concept is a URI. And this URI resolves all these English uh, uh, spellings into, multi, into the multilingual labels of these different concepts. With this, we can link. Example for Wikipedia. So every address record uh, displays uh, 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 the, the little chapter from Wikipedia, what it's about. Uh, we can uh, link to other databases. We link uh, to data, data world bank org. We link to uh, FAO's own uh, statistical databases or to the International Food Policy Research Institute. Uh, we we, we link to, uh, to other articles from the same journal. Uh, or we are using, in this case, alignment between different thesauri, in this case between the Chinese agricultural thesaurus and Agrovoc, to retrieve similar data from the Chinese agricultural science abstract database. Without this, it has to be a repeat for Agrovoc. Without that, it has to be export, import. It simply works about semantic alignments of uh, two concept schemes and an agreement of data exchange between two data providers. And in this, uh, with, with this simple uh, measures, Agris has extended its coverage from the 8 million uh, bibliographical records that are in Agris to, I don't know, uh, more than 15 million or so from the Chinese database. Uh, and so this is the outcome from a a relatively banal bibliographical record, you get a rich data page with information around the topic of your bibliographical record. So this is an example where linked open data technology is used to uh, create richer, richer web pages. Uh, and uh, the basis for this is, uh, is, uh, is Agrovoc, and uh, Katarina has already explained what this means to go through linked open vocabularies. Uh, you see here uh, in the uh, scores exact match all the different linkings from Agrovoc that has been established to other vocabularies, and through these linkings, automatically, you'll see here CAS, this is a Chinese, Chinese example, automatically. Uh, other data sets which are indexed with their own vocabularies, but their own vocabularies linked back to Agrova can be used. Uh, and uh, I don't want to say this is the linked open data example. This is only one example how you can, by using open data, this is a 
the most important thing that is open data to exist, and then using linked open data technologies uh, to give uh, a much richer experiences to your users in getting information. Katarina, recap. A bit, uh, a recap of what we've said uh, today and uh, with um, our conclusion. So the first conclusion is that you need to understand your own constraints that can be of various nature. We are sort of focused on constraints on administrative administration level and uh, pipeline, so the various steps needed. You will have to look it up, look for yourself uh, where you need to, uh, what you need to address first. Um, this is a rapid evolving uh, world, so keep an eye on technical improvements. The sparkle, the um, the problem of, of uh, the, the strain the Sparkle endpoint puts in your server is considered to be uh, something to uh, something to address. But there's things moving there. For example, the exposure level. Um, perhaps most importantly, try to be smart from the start. Here, in brief, uh, a recap of uh, our reflection. So try, start small. One data set only or few. Uh, start relevant, uh, prioritize your data set, choose the data set you want to get to link data or the data set you own and, the, and also the data set you want to link to. Uh, criteria, uh, what's central to your application or what gives you more visibility and so you can leverage on that for further work. Uh, start from somewhere, um, reuse experience as much as possible. Um, there are so many initiatives around, uh, uh, try to give, uh, give you pointers to a few of them, um, there you can get inspiration. Go in steps, open first and then link, so you might decide to go for all simply, simply open data first and then add the links to it. And look for, for collaboration. Look for collaboration, this is important, in union, in union there is strength. So power, uh, find your own way of union. That could be organize a consortium maxima to maximize your resource, or simply look for experience and support from other organization in the same area. Well, I hope that was somehow helpful. Thank you all. Okay, now we have eaten up 15 minutes of your time to make questions, but we will stay with this slide a bit, so you can write down before you get the presentation our email addresses, and we can be punished uh, by uh, having eaten up all this time uh, by you. If you have a question and your question will not be answered in this session here, you write us an email, and we promise you we will answer. Thank you, Johannes and Katarina. Um, we already have a few questions, and uh, you're, you're free. Um, uh, to add more questions at the bottom, you'll see a, a questions input form for those of you that want to also ask. I have a couple of questions um, regarding Drupal. Um, one of them is Drupal, doesn't it present its own learning curve and resource challenges? Keeping Drupal up to date, Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, etc. So isn't Drupal an issue for an organization that is already under resource under resourced? Experience under resource in terms of experience, willingness, or technical team, etc. Technical infrastructure, isn't it a problem? Okay, we answer one by one. Not otherwise we will forget. And this, okay, that's fine. There's, okay. There's, then there's another one. That's one. So isn't it itself? Isn't Drupal itself, uh, given its challenges and its learning curve, a problem for an under-resourced organization? Okay, um, sure. Uh, if you compare to do nothing, it has a learning curve and it's a challenge. But if you want to do something and you have uh, and you have things uh, and you want to organize textual data, then it's the issue of Drupal is the easiest thing what you can do because anything else will make you more headache. It will make you headache. Sure, you have to learn, and does any system also update? But doing it. Doing it in a different way will be will be worse. Uh, this does not mean that Drupal is a solution for everything. No, uh, it's a 
it's only if you if you have a, an example that typically you have a, a bibliographical data or institutions data about persons data and then there are also already uh, uh, already customized solutions and then maybe you do not want your own Drupal installation uh, you could you you could go to existing Drupal cloud installation and simply use your your piece of it. This is always something to consider, at least not to put uh, IT overhead on your organization. Thank you. And the second question is: Can you tell us if there is a Drupal package or set of modules that work best? This depends on your problem, what you want to resolve. If you want to set up, uh, uh, an example, a repository, an open data repository for, for publications, we can tell you, we can, we can tell you a, a group I set up. But there are for many things. But as I said, it's not the solution. It's only a proposal of the possible solutions if you want to facilitate your way and you want to start to, to write C++ or Java. Okay. Another question. Agra appears to be based on an aggregative model of load ingest, harmonization, and presentation. Can you comment on how federated models are or are not appropriate when contributing members of a load collective are trying to achieve similar goals? Yeah. Um, federated models are nice in an ideal world. Uh, in, an, uh, in an ideal world where uh, connectivity is always quick and 100%, uh, there are no power shortages, never at, ne at no point, uh, then you might uh, think that uh, feder federation, because of uh, uh, you, you keep all the data decentralized, uh, it could be better. What, what, what we are more thinking at the moment is that uh, also decentralized aggregation is something that can be possible. Data sets are maintained decentralized. All address partners have their own data set. They are using them for their purposes. Address is one of the aggregators which use it for different purposes. It's not the way how this data set lives. This data set live their own way as distributed, decentralized data sets of organizations. And these organizations, a lot of them do many different things with that. Not all, not all, but a, a, lot, a, a lot of them. So the old uh, difference between federated and, uh, and, and centralized, I, for, for my thinking, it's overcome. Because uh, it's uh, uh, in, 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 in an area of cloud computing, uh, you, you simply have to ask a different question. That's a question, how can I resolve a specific problem? And then I do what I want to do for things. And it would be to say some more, but uh, um, it's good for now. Another question. The multilingual example, was it specifically to enable searching in other languages, or is it actually translation of resources? It's both. It depends on where um, where your attention is. Uh, it's an effort of translation of resources, uh, but then it's used to allow uh, multilingual search. Yeah. In in English, for example. Obviously, what you are translating is a concept. You are not translating text, which is a different uh, a different area of technology and research. But there are some uh, some automatic. Uh, translation systems that, that are based also on, on concepts. But in, in really it is uh, to give multilingual search and categorization. Because many, many people uh, are able to read a specific language. For example, I'm able to read a Spanish text. But I'm not able to search in Spanish. I would never get uh, the, the correct uh, terminology. I am able to search in, let's say, in German, Italian, and English. and uh, Using multilingual vocabularies, you can search in your language and you retrieve in the language in which the resource is done. Then you know it's relevant. You can try this automatic translation, and if it's very relevant, you go to a translation service. 
Okay, another question. Recently, I was making a pitch to my group for a project that would resemble your AGRIS project from a cultural heritage database and collections, however. The response was, that's just aggregation. Uh, could you please explain, differentiate a linked data effort versus aggregation? Or do you see link, linked as aggregation? The architecture of AGRIS is double. Uh, Agris is aggregating only the core. So only the core of bibliographic database uh, is aggregated. All the linked data are not aggregated, but are linked on the fly. So, an example, the, uh, the GBIS data uh, about uh, biodiversity, or the World Bank data about species, not GBIS data about species, species distribution, or the World Bank data about population, or the IFPRI data on the Global uh, Hunger Index, or FAO data on countries. There are nothing of this is aggregated. This is all linked, and it's also linked on the fly. It's using APIs and, uh, uh, and Sparkle endpoints, and this makes also the particularity up. It sometimes doesn't work, because services are down. So if you want to do playing around with extra services, after a while, you will think about aggregation. About So a lot of semantic playground that we have in Agris, we could not do with all the linked uh, uh, services. But we can link the services to the Agris backbone. So uh, the, the aggregation in Agris is, if you, if, you took an, uh, if you took an Agris page, it's not more than 10% of the data. Thank you. Another question. What tool did you use in the Kenya example to link the open data sources and give close matches? Um, yeah, in the Kenya, there was a, I think there was a country, uh, I, I don't know, from DBpedia, Kenya, or Kenya data from, from GBIP. Uh, uh, what, what, what we mostly use in all these examples are AgroVoc. Uh, uh, Agrovoc uh, concepts, and uh, and we use sometimes specific mappings if we have country lists for geographic uh, linkages, uh, and then we have a, a data, data data sources. We do not need specific tools because uh, an, an open database is, as uh, Secretary Wilsack said, open and machine readable. So they give us our Sparkle endpoint, like DBpedia or a specific API, a documented API, as data brought by or. If they then publish their vocabularies, or if they use some of the vocabularies to which Agrovoc is already mapped, we simply can write three lines of code and we can get the data into Agris. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, do you have ways to assess, understand data access patterns on AGRIS? I know that terms that are from your original bibliographic records would work easily with analytic tools, but what about the unrelated data that is linked on the right side of your screen? So I'm not quite sure which cell that was referring to. But. No, no, I, I, I completely understood the question. I have no answer. There. Uh, I'm very interested in, uh, in, in, in doing like this. This is a typical thing where we never have time uh, and uh, money to invest in. Uh, we did some analysis uh, on using of, yeah, we use that of the easy part, uh, of uh, the part that we control, but we would need to do some click-through analysis to study user behavior. And uh, what we did is we made uh, a user survey I forgot now, but we got quite a good uh, uh, response rate if they consider uh, the use of the linked uh, uh, linked data part uh, of advantage, and we got a 90% yes, yes uh, answer on this. Okay, one final question. What kind of library system does FAO use? What kind of role does the library system play in generating and manipulating linked data? Is the final OPAC independent of the library system? Um, I can't answer this question 
because uh, we are not the library. We are, uh, we are, uh, we are, um, our unit, uh, we, ha we had some linkages to the library, but this is long ago, uh, and uh, uh, we have, uh, the FAO library for us is uh, an Agris center, as uh, any other Agris centers that contribute to Agris in a way uh, that many, many, many other Agris centers also do. But we have no specific insight or information about what the FAO library does. Thank you. Well, I think we have just about used up our time. I want to thank both uh, Katerina and Johannes for today's presentation. Very, very interesting. And I also want to thank all of you who joined us here live on the webinar and to all of you who will enjoy the recorded session. Um, with that, I think I will turn um, the, the session over to Stefan for any final uh, announcements. Yeah, I just wanted to add, this was no joke to say that you can send us uh, emails uh, with questions. Uh, this is serious and uh, because we are serious thinking that uh, getting more open data and getting more linked open data is enormous important for our goal in FAO uh, to uh, improve uh, agriculture and nutrition and for the development goals overall. So, so this is uh, something what is absolutely uh, in, in, in our duties to answer your question when you uh, have that. And in addition, um, Johannes and Katarina will have access to any of the unanswered questions uh, that can be specifically answered as well. Stefan. Hi guys, uh, thank you guys for the presentation today, it was great. Um, to our attendees, I would like you to know that the slides and the recording will be made available to you guys via a follow-up email within 48 hours of today's broadcast. Okay, well thank you all and have a pleasant day. Have a pleasant day guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.